The country of Finland is offering a master class in happiness. This is the focus group. They're all business, except when they're not. It's the focus group with Tim Bennett and John Nash. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Focus Group. As always, I'm here with my good friend and co-host, Mr. John T. Nash. Now in our 15th year, we're happy. Seems to be an awful lot of happiness things lately when I saw this. <laughs> yeah, true. Our shop talk involves happiness with the, the country of Finland and why people are so happy. So we'll get to that later in the show. And uh, But before then, we've got our usual lineup here where we do our, our banter, our catch-up. We do a story that caught our eye. We do a business birthday, the only show in the universe that does a business birthday, and then we're going to visit with our friends at Deep Discount all week, or all week, all month. During September, we've been celebrating the Criterion Collection, and Mr. Nash conducts this game called Pick That Flick, where he plays a movie clip, and uh, if you guess correctly, you can win something from the Criterion Collection, and uh, brought to you by Criterion, brought to you by the Criterion Collection, our friends at Deep Discount as well. So Mr. Nash will clue us in on Pick That Flick later on in the broadcast. So how are you doing, John? I'm doing good. And I'm, I'm wondering, like, so these are, uh, I went to see the eye doctor uh, to get my checkup. And I hadn't had my eyes checked in three years, which is not smart. Everybody get your eyes checked. <laughs> but my, my reading prescription was exactly the same. He said, you don't have to change anything. So I went ahead and I got these new readers from I Buy Direct. I like that. Like Stylish. Bucks. Well, they're tortoise, they're the tortoise frames, right? And I... I'm thinking of as I'm looking at myself on camera, like maybe I'm like Donnie Deutsch on MSN on Morning Joe. Well, let's not push it. <laughs> you'd have to have some sort of clown outfit on with a over. You'd have to be overly tanned with sunspots and and bleached white hair stuck up. But other than that, yeah. <laughs> other than that, Mrs. Lincoln, how is the plight? Are these um, prescription glasses or are they readers? They're my they're readers, but they require they are prescription. One one I I am uh, was it a um, astigmatism. So one eye is a little bit different than the other, but and you got them for same. how much? Oh, after all the discounts they give you $42. Oh my God. These stupid things I have on were like $500. Yeah. Yeah. Because look at your, that's Bob and I all love the frames that you have because it's basically the, you know, the frameless thing. So it's the lens and then the, yeah, they're not yeah, cheap. They're progressive. Those, it's a progressive lens too. Another, so yeah. For driving and everything. Either. And of course I picked an Austrian frame. So, you know, as if there's so, someone's flying over from Austria with <laughs> to Rehoboth Beach. <laughs> Maybe they so fly to Cape May, take the ferry down. Of course, I sat hey, on them once. You know, and, and you I know, remember I that. Need, I, I, but I need to get another pair. I need a backup pair, so maybe I need to. That's why I ordered a bunch of these, so I have like a pair here. I can, yeah. I, I just don't want to be without because it's that that's that thing where the eye doctor's like, "Hey, your eyes are doing great. They're the same as they were in 2020." Wow. And keep going, and I'm like, yeah, but I still need these for small. Yeah, well, it's that's their age. Hey, remember, um, a a week or two ago, I had a caught my eye about a woman who bought a um NC Wyeth painting right. in a thrift store for four bucks because mm-hmm. she was like frame shopping. Wanted the frame. Well, yeah. Well, <laughs> the auction happened. Um, that that where they sold the NC Wyeth, and it went for a hundred and ninety one thousand dollars. Can you imagine? Did she sell it? Four dollars, <laughs> one hundred and ninety-one. That's the return on investment is phenomenal, right? I was in Ohio and thought I would. I came across a couple of you know famous paintings, and I remember I, I took pictures of them and sent them back east here to friends, to Richard mm-hmm. and Bruce and a few other people, and all that came back was no, no, <laughs> no. Did they know that so so quickly? Well, I, I I said this looks just like Bruce. Our friend Bruce has this. He's a pretty well renowned uh, Mid Atlantic art dealer and antique dealer, and he had this picture that I've always loved. It's it's somewhat of an Art Deco boxing thing, and I thought I came across almost the exact similar photo or similar painting in this little thrift store in Ohio. So I'm like, oh my god! And it, it was three hundred dollars, and so I take a picture of it, and I just get back no. And I said, "Are you sure? No, no. <laughs> Should I buy this? No." <laughs> there is but a really know. famous painting, a couple of them actually, um, of boxers in a ring. And I thought that that was done in the '30s. Maybe is that what you're? If, yeah. I don't know if you're thinking yeah. of that artist. 
Well, he well, has now. some, and they yeah, and they're you know they sell for thousands, and so I'm thinking, oh, here's one of them. It's three hundred dollars at the thrift store, and uh, we had a horrible frame on it, and it looked like somebody took bed posts and made a frame. But <laughs> um, yeah, so I thought I was gonna find. You know, I'm waiting to find that find, John. I, I, you and I'm me not. both. You and me both. I I think we need to go somewhere unpredictable to find the frame of a, or an object like the declaration of independence behind a, something, right? Like we need to go somewhere to get this like a, yeah. Well, I but was I think convinced every... I, I, yeah, I was convinced I had some wealth. I, I was convinced I had a, had a hot item. I it's, you've, you've seen it in the house. It's this bird painting on silk. Yep. It, it looks like a Audubon, one of the Audubon um, paintings. And uh, Matt, our friend Matt took it to the antique road show when it was in Atlantic city. I think they put a hundred dollars on it. <laughs> We were waiting for you know, thousands, thousands of dollars. Do you remember? Oh my gosh, look what you have. <laughs> I don't know if they still does this, but you remember Sucrets? Yes. Those throat lozenge. I remember when we were younger, when we were small, they came in a metal box. Yes, yes. So I'm going through a bunch of things, and I find a Sucrets metal box. <laughs> and I open it up, and there's a bunch of silver dollars and oh, silver wow. half dollars. My granddad used to give me silver dollars and half dollars. And I'm thinking one of these, baby, I bet you. So I, hit, I, you can actually hit. go online and look at the issuing date, the whole bit, and to see if maybe your silver dollar is worth more than a dollar. Because I read somewhere that one, there's a particular <clears throat> coin that was minted. I don't know if there's an error in it or something, but it's worth thousands of dollars. Of course, I go on and it's like, <laughs> your dollar's worth a dollar. A dollar. <laughs> or your dollar's worth a dollar five. <laughs> I have that with silver certificates of you Did know, you really? $2. Dollar, but yeah, I have all that. I still have it in an envelope. I don't know what to do with them. But uh, yeah, it's $2. Oh, it's worth $2. $5. Oh, it's worth $5. <laughs> Before it disintegrates, I probably should use it. From the I, 30s, I think one of the It's bills. like savings bonds. You know, I found an envelope. Maybe it was about six years ago. I found an envelope filled with savings bonds. And, and it, it was a lot, right? And I thought, okay, I am going to be cashing out. But, you know, basically, the bond, once it matures, that's it. No it's matter how long you hold on to it. If it was dollars Exactly. So, I go to so the what bank do you do with those? Because actually, our, our friend Carl mentioned that, too. Do you just take them to a regular bank? Yep. And they can cash them out, and that's because they were that's they sad. were treasury bonds or something. So I got like five or six hundred for these bonds, and I remember talking to the teller what because they have to run the serial numbers, and I said, "Are you sure they're not worth?" <laughs> and, and she and she smiles and she said, "I get this all the time, hon." She said, "You know how bonds work? You know, you buy for a certain price, it matures to the face value, and that's that." I'm like, okay, can't You're hoping there was high? interest, compounded interest. <laughs> oh, this, this one's worth Just a million. Just for me. This one's worth a million. This one's worth two point three million. This one's can you imagine? That's what I want. Have something happen. I bought yes. the Powerball ticket thinking I was going to hit, you know, and I spend the money. How? What am I going to do with the eight hundred million dollars? I had it all spent, but uh, I didn't win. I get one number. So, but it's going to be a big. It's going to be one of the fourth largest jackpots this this week, it, Mister. This Nashville. latest one. Yeah. So you get a Powerball mm. ticket. Someone's going to win. Oh, in New yeah, York I, and California are the states that win the most, apparently. So you got a better chance than me. Yeah, huh. I think it's pure population. You know, I think yes. it's just because of the large population. Statistically, populations. yeah, you're probably right. There's so many more people playing. I remember one time Powerball was really high, and I went to, I got in the fever, and I go, I think I've told the story before. <laughs> I stand outside this thing, and I don't know how to play, and I get a thing, and this woman stands next to me. She goes, do you know what you're doing? I said, no. no. She goes, just phone the numbers. I said, any numbers? She goes, I, and she turns away so I don't see her numbers because clearly oh, she got her numbers from, you don't, I don't know, high above. You don't want to share the prize. <laughs> yeah, but she was laughing, and, and then we all put our things in. I think I spent 10 or 20 bucks on Powerball, and as we all turn away with our little stubs, cl claiming the future, right? We're going to be rich. She just said in passing, she goes, wasn't that fun? She goes, you can might as well throw them away. You're not going to win. I was like, okay, oh. have a great day. <laughs> she but was someone, right, though. But someone does win. <laughs> Right, someone, someone does, does win. win, and I, I, I often wonder. They never ask. I don't know. I've seen some of those interviews, but I'd like to, them to. If you were sitting there in front of, you know, you and Bob are sitting in front of the the TV, or you you look at it online, probably because nobody's watching the drawing. You'd probably just be in disbelief, like, oh my gosh, yeah. we've got all five. If, if imagine holding the winning ticket, I right. Oh, wow. Particularly like this that one that's going to be close to eight hundred million or whatever. I guess. First thing you do is shut off your, you know, you get new cell phone numbers you don't tell anybody yep. about. You you get an attorney first, and you make sure you start putting yourself behind, you know, 
hide like there are some people who've moved to gated communities you've heard well, about because this, right? all of a sudden you have cousins that show up you didn't know you had right <laughs> i don't know if you know but you know <laughs> a little bit behind on my mortgage Ure for Hollywood. <laughs> All the cousins moved into Ure, and that's into that. Yeah. Inside joke, folks. I had, a funny, jokes, I had a funny story. I had a funny story about that place just recently now, and I can't remember what it was. I Ure, Ure, and Dal Winnie, and the whole the whole troop. Mm-hmm. And uh, I forgot what it was. It was it was probably it was something to do that you brought up on our our podcast, which is TFG on Button. There was something you had brought up and referenced, and I wanted to. To reference Dal Winnie, but then we we moved on to something else. I'll have to think about what it was. But it was <laughs> Ure. We didn't do Ure. the spa Ure. there. We should have done the spa. I'm sure I got I'm sure I got bit by bed bugs in Ure. Uh, that place you and I stayed in. We were there for like one night. You had a you had such an early flight. That's not the I barely Swiss village. You. I had to get up at three. It was a Swiss yeah, was village crazy. or something we were in. Mm-hmm. It was hideous. Oof. It was horrible. We should have gone to tell you right. <laughs> So, Mr. Nash, what caught your eye this week? What caught your eye? Here's what Tim and John found. I'm surprised this didn't catch your eye, but I'm sure you saw it. Um, and th- and Bob has been he's been <laughs> beside himself with this one because the headline reads, Bob Ross's first TV painting goes on sale for nearly $10 million. Put a little tree so, right here, a little tree right here. <laughs> exactly. And so the, I'm, if you're watching on uh, YouTube, on the, the video, um, I put up a picture of him and the painting. And this oh is God. the closest they get, actually. It's interesting. They don't really show the painting that, and I figured out why, because they're auctioning and they don't want people to, you know, take pics of it the whole bit. This is the very first one he did on his TV show. My and so God. Bob says to me, what would ever make something like that worth $10 million? And I said, it's obvious to me. And he said, what? I said, it's not the painting or not the quality of the work. And it's a, uh, a landscape. It's the fact that it's Bob Ross. And it's the very right. first one he ever did on TV. And, he, you know, he's, such, he's got such a name, right? Who would have bought it, I wonder? Did I don't say? know. It's, but the painting is called a, a Walk in the Woods in a, uh, a Minneapolis gallery. It's the first of 400 paintings that they, they plan to actually sell. But the reason they gave this one, as I said a moment ago, the, uh, the that that eye popping number of 10 million, it may not get there, but is because it's the very first one he did and everybody watched. And that TV show is, you know, that very first episode is what launched his entire career, which led to books and supplies and paintbrushes and, and scandal later on. And then he was robbed of, you know, there's a, and there's documentaries about yeah, him. I was going to so, say, have you watched the documentary? It was, I think it was yes, on Netflix, I wasn't it? Yeah. I was, was always amazed because I would watch it on PBS you know, you'd fall on it once in a while. And he was in a dark black, essentially a black studio, right? It was just yeah. dark. And his picture with, with the light on it. And the easel. And he would just put a little paint right here. You know, it's very calming. <laughs> very calm. But he, it was amazing to me how he would look like he was just doing, just mixing things and making it look somewhat, I don't, I don't know, just kind of freeform sloppy, but it looked like a tree, right? Yeah. I mean, he would do this stuff like, we're going to make a pine tree here. Tap, 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 tap. He'd, he'd start hitting the the canvas and lo and behold, I would think that's never going to work. And then sure enough, it looked like a tree. Interesting. Yeah. Interestingly, he died in 95. He hosted his show from 83, 1983 to 1994. So 11 years, you know, for his legacy, each episode, he spoke directly to viewers. He encouraged to paint with him as he created idealized scenes, et cetera, et cetera. I love this paragraph. None of Ross's paintings, including this A Walk in the Woods, would be confused for masterpieces. But that wasn't the point. <laughs> confused. It's for a masterpiece. But that's not the point. What nasty queen wrote that article. Yeah. <laughs> so there you go. Um, you know, but that's because he just believed everyone could paint. You know, yeah. here's how you're going to do it. You're going to dab the brush. Have you ever on. tried I remember to paint? watching it. Yeah. Have you ever tried? So to that paint? was what that's that's what what caught. Do I excuse me? Have you ever tried to paint? Oh yeah, I in college when I was I had a, a painting class and. How'd you do? Well, I'll give you an example of how it went. I'm I'm one day I'm <laughs> in class and I'm doing a painting and the instructor always was drinking clear coffee at ten in the morning and my my studio mate this girl that used to stand next to me she's like she goes mm, just can't wait till we get <laughs> clear that clear coffee said, coffee break she goes yeah, it was vodka or something right. So he comes and stands behind me for the longest time. It was unnerving. And I'm painting this scene of an astronaut repairing a satellite or something. Oh, my God. And it's something easy. Yeah. And he goes, mm, you know something, John? 
He goes, I might consider a career in graphic design. I don't know about painting. And I said, well, as a matter of fact, I'm studying graphic design. He goes, good, good. <laughs> then he moves on. So that was basically my warning that I'm not a painter. <laughs> I, I did a graphic design class too. I liked it, but I didn't do it till my senior year. So you, you had done it from the beginning, didn't you? Yeah, I fell into it uh, when I went to college. I, I went to school to study film, hopefully to become a special effects technician so I could someday work on the new Star, Star Wars movie. But you had to take art classes, and I fell into 3D design, graphic design, typography, and I, I just loved it. So, yeah, yeah happy accident. Yeah, good for you. My uh, my caught caught your eye, and I, I did see the I did see the thing about Bob Ross. But so I'm glad you I'm glad you used it because I I didn't bookmark it, and until I saw you had picked it, I I'd forgotten about it. Mine is uh, a little different. The headline says Hilton boss Chris Nasetta revealed that the number one he's revealed the number one complaint at hotels and it's not what you think so there was a um, according to Chris said he's the president and CEO of Hilton uh, Hilton hotels and he said the number one complaint among hotel guests isn't the lackluster breakfast or buffets or noisy neighbors or even dirty rooms do you want to guess what it is mr. Nash well, you have a picture here. If you're watching on YouTube, it, Tim put a picture of a bunch of nicely folded towels. Is it the linen? It's the towels. It's the towels. Okay. So, yeah. So he said, it's the towels. So this was a uh, fast company was doing an innovation festival in New York last week. And um, he got up and gave one of the one of the presentations. And he said that uh, he said that it's really all about the towels. He said, it's the quantity, how thick they are. He said, all of that. And he said, well, everybody seems to think it's about Wi-Fi or the latest gadgets or some of those other things. He said it really just goes back to basics and back to basic hospitality. He said the idea that you have all these fancy bells and whistles is nice. He said, but the guests will uh, be disappointed if their basic needs aren't met. And so he has recommended to the hospitality industry that they get back to basics. And he said uh, the really important trend that we're seeing since the pandemic or post-pandemic is the same old, same old, which uh, he said is that people um, want things done maniacally well, consistently and at a high quality and in a friendly way. So he said it's really the little things that matter. And they've seen since the pandemic a 42.5% increase in revenue per room. Wow. He said by, by getting back to basics. He said so much so that they've opened 355 new hotels since 2021. That's a lot. Considering the industry hit a tailspin when, when 2020, right? And when COVID yeah. shut everything down, this is pretty amazing. So it added 58,000 rooms to their portfolio. The one thing he said is they've started something. I've not heard about this. It's called Spark by Hilton. Have you heard of the Spark line of is, hotels? Is it a mid-priced um, hotel so, variant? You're, you're close. I, I guess you, it would be close. It's a premium economy. Ah, okay. So it's aimed at discerning <laughs> wait, wait, wait. travelers on a Premium budget. economy? Right, so it's what like exactly the airlines you tricking you into getting the seat you used to have ten years ago for right. more money, right? Okay, for more money. So somebody said, "What exactly is premium economy?" He says, "It's it's economy in quotes, but it's at the very high end of economy." <laughs> he said he thinks it's the most disruptive thing that they've done in years, and it's not necessarily about the lowest price point as much as it is about offering uh, a great quality, high quality experience from a friendly you know, friendly staff. He said all the consulting firms and all the research you do, um, he said at the end of the day, it all comes back to treating the customer correctly. And uh, so he says, where does that leave us with towels? He said, we have a new program we're implementing globally called the Terry program across all brands. He said, every towel in the system is going to be revamped. We will have the best towels in the business. So if you're looking for a good, good hotel towel, go to the hotel towel, go to the Hilton <laughs> I've told this story before, but one of the regional vice presidents, one of my favorite stories was uh, I'm, we had a I was regional vice prompt president you to tell it. <laughs> that every year insisted I, because I was in charge of meetings and, and, and through the marketing area and events, and uh, insisted that we have at least one meeting a year at the Ritz Carlton Hotels because he and his wife would bring two suitcases filled with old towels from the prior year uh, hand towels and washcloths and beach towels and face gloves, switched them out for the newer ones at the Ritz. So they would, you know, as the linens were brought in, they'd put their old ones out from their suitcase and put the pack, the new ones. And then, uh, of course, wait to the next year to come back and re replenish again. 
Not to be done by the other VP who would ask for toilet paper every day. I heard this because the staff would, you know, again, when I was running the meetings, he would ask for a roll of toilet paper every day, at least one or two. Said he was out of toilet paper. But he was hoarding it. He was putting it in his bag, take it home. Toilet paper? Toilet paper, so he didn't have to buy it. Then whenever he traveled, he would take all the toilet paper and ask for toilet paper. Yeah. Crazies. I would get it from the hotel. The hotel would say, um, you know, Mr. Smith is uh, asking for toilet paper every day. And I'd, mm-hmm. and I'd be like, let me just get him a... Give him a box of Charmin or something. For can you imagine? I, Took it off the roll too. Would take it from I, like the one that was sitting yeah, there in the, the hotel the room with the little unwrapped. folded triangle. Yeah. Right. Take that. I home get too. the. I get. The, I always got the towels. The towel the, one the, is brilliant. I think because <laughs> it's kind of this weird borrowing program, right? Mm-hmm. Where they're returning what they borrowed a year ago. Um, the TP just—it's not that expensive, is it? Not really. You, you, I mean. You, Unless he thought that hotel bought this toilet paper from some fantastic company or part of the world. I mean, it's usually coming from one of two vendors, so it's... <laughs> yeah. I always took the soaps and shampoos because... Oh, that you stuff encouraged get, me to do that, too. And that stuff would get thrown away, and I would bring it down to the boathouse, or you take yep. it to the gym. So you need to, you know, you use get, it, like, get a you shower You would open a little it. sample bottle, yeah. right? And you'd yeah. use maybe a little bit, and they have to throw it away. Right. Um, so I, so think I always it was took wise. that stuff. Yep. Yeah, I always took that stuff, and I would leave it at the boathouse, and it would all disappear. People would use it, so or yeah. they would say they'd recommend you give it to homeless shelters or something. And um, so I always took that stuff, but I never would have thought of taking toilet paper. No, neither from the hotel. Would I, no. I can't imagine what people have taken. I do remember the Four Seasons said to me, you know, they always have that sign: you're going to get charged one hundred and ten dollars or something if you take the robe. Yeah, and I said, how many people take the robe? He goes, oh, a lot of people. And I said, wow. And you charge them. He goes, oh, you would never charge. Yes, you can't accuse them of stealing. So I would take the robes every now and then. I got but a four the or five sign of them. said you will be charged. Sign says you'll be charged. And I said, do you? Re-? I said, how many people take the robes? He goes, oh, everybody does. He goes, that's why we have our name on them. He goes, they get stolen. Mm. And I said, and so but- you charge them one hundred and ten dollars? He goes, no, you would never accuse, never accuse a guest of stealing. So it was a deterrent. It was, it was a like deterrent, a... but people okay. would still take it. Not no. It's like people that would screw around with the. Uh, although they did charge them the uh, honor bar, or whatever the yeah, uh, the, the, the mini, mini bar. bar. Yeah. yeah, I was in once where it was looted. I, I checked into the hotel. I opened it up, and it was a mess. It was all empties and everything in there. And I immediately contacted them downstairs, and I said, "I did not. I just got here." I said, "The mini bar is <laughs> okay." It's like you a were swarm smart. of locusts came you through. Were smart, yeah. right? So I didn't get charged, but uh, yeah. So that was, uh, so the Hilton Hotel, go get yourself some towels yeah. if you want to head over there. So many of you know here on uh, on the Focus Group that Deep Discount is uh, one of our partners here. You can learn more about them at our website, focusgroupradio.com, and click on them and start shopping away. They've always got great deals on all kinds of media. And this month, in the month of September, we've been celebrating the Criterion Collection, and uh, we've been playing a game called Pick That Flick. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to Mr. Nash. Before we do Pick That Flick, we do have a couple of... Oh, we have a new release, actually. So yes, as Tim said, it's Criterion Collection Month here on the Focus Group and at Deep Discount. Uh, so the whole month, their Criterion Collection discs are on sale. If you know Criterion, it's the gold standard, we like to say, of, of movie releases. And it, usually a cleaned-up print beautiful audio track and a lot of great extras including you know interviews with directors and actors and how scenes came about the whole bit a really great way to have a a look into some of your favorite movies so uh this week uh we have a new release and it's moon age daydream and this is a documentary about david bowie um and it and so the director brent morgan was granted unprecedented access to david bowie's estate and what he delivers is that what they call a visually stunning celebration of the thin white duke, which is uh, David Bowie's nickname, career as the always shifting course of Bowie's artistic development as actor and painter as well as a musician. The movie is about 134 minutes. And I think it, you know, I've seen clips from it and I love this director's style. So I can, I can heartily recommend uh, Moon Age Daydream and it's available at deep discount for $34.99 on Blu-ray or 4K Ultra HD. And that is a Criterion disc. Now, because the director was this guy who I, I knew he had done something else that I loved, this Brett Morgan. And it turns out the other movie he did that you can also get at Deep Discount, it's not Criterion, but you can also get it at Deep Discount, is called The Kid Stays in the Picture. It is an absolute favorite of mine because of the style. of It's all still imagery. 
and uh, Vody audio voiceover is just really a well done documentary, and it's about studio head Robert Evans, who used to be at Paramount, and he greenlit um, The Godfather and Chinatown. So he had a lot of interesting hits behind him, and and how he became the head of the studio is just a great story, and and how his career went. So you know, Where same the heck director. Did you ever see this? Oh, years ago. I loved it. I fell in love with it. Someone recommended it. and Did you go to a the theater re- to see it? No, no. It had been out for a long really? time. I forget what year it came out in, actually. Does it say there? I think it came out in... It says uh, release date 2021. Originally mm, 2002. 2002. There you go. So that's... Yeah. So thank you, Tim. That's That's when it first came out. And just love it to death because Bob Evans actually is the voice behind the narration as well. And he describes how he went from the Beverly Hilton at being at a, at a, a pool boy or a lifeguard all the way up to the head of Paramount and all the little machinations in between. So same director as our release this week, which is David Bo- Moon, Moon Age Daydreams on Criterion. Just thought you might want to know if you want to get to do both a movie discs. review column, John. I know, yeah, you, but you get them both a deep discount. So now we're going to play our game. It's the last week of the Criterion Collection giveaway criterion gave us blu-rays and dvds to give to you guys for this game everybody's done a fantastic job a couple of people came real close to there was one or two really hard ones so i decided to go out with a one that i hope is a fun and easy to get clue it works this way i'm going to play the clue if you know the title of the movie this came from send it to me at letters at focusgroupradio.com that's letters at focusgroupradio.com. Include your mailing address if it's an email you don't check too often or if it's one you use all the time. Just I'll let you know if you want. You can send me it. We only use your mailing address to send you the disc. So uh, here we go with this week's clue. Oh! Oh, a house gun! How all corrupt! <laughs> Shall I play it again, Mr. Bennett? You're thinking. I see you yeah, thinking, but right? I, I, I couldn't understand. I, I, I couldn't understand what she said or something. All right, well, listen again. Let's hear it again. Oh! Oh, a half gun! How all corrupt! <laughs> a half gun? Oh, a Halston. How oh, oh corrupt. Oh, a Halston. How, uh, yeah. <laughs> So if you know that movie, (laughs) letters at focusgroupradio.com. We want to thank our partner here on the Focus Group Deep Discount for playing, for providing the discs along with the Criterion folks. Um, You can get to Deep Discount by going to focusgroupradio.com, clicking on the Deep Discount logo, go down the rabbit hole, and if you pick up Moon Age Daydreams, consider picking up The Kid Stays in the Picture, same director earlier, but just a really well done film. We are going to take a super quick break, and when we return, we have a business birthday, the only show in the universe that does that. And Tim found a great article on uh, Finland. Is it Finland, Tim? Finland, yes. Giving a master class in happiness. And uh, so we will return right after this. You're listening to The Focus Group with Tim and John. Learn more at focusgroupradio.com. Now, back to the Focus Group with Tim and John. Available pretty much everywhere. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Focus Group. Tim Bennett here with John Nash. Be sure to uh, check out everything and all of our media at focusgroupradio.com. And uh, without further ado, Mr. Nash, we have our business birthday. Everyone does celebrity birthday greetings, but the Focus Group is the only show in the universe that celebrates business birthdays. Now, John and I have been doing these birthdays for 15 years. Is it 15 years? I guess it must be, John. Or at least 14. Tim, it's a it's a lot. And yeah. And you're and, amazing at how you find them. I'll just well, say and that. We, and we, we, we're trying not to, if you're a follower of the show, we try not to repeat any um, over the time, which is tough to do. Now, Mr. Nash is usually celebrated this week because Mr. Nash has a birthday coming up. Mm-hmm. And uh, John would do mine. I would do, do his birthday. And we would always have a nice party in the, uh, in the studio. But because we're, we're, we're doing these remote uh, now, we don't do that. So I do miss doing that. But I think we, I was looking back, and I think with your birthday, we did 
five or six different yes. versions for yeah, you. Yeah, they rotated right around there, yeah. So so the um so in, in trying to keep with not repeating, we're not gonna do your birthday this year. Okay. <laughs> But I wish you happy birthday. Thank you. And uh, which, you know, and our listeners will, will, I'm sure as well, once they listen to this and realize it's your birthday. I'm not going to say any more about it. <laughs> Although you're going on a nice trip somewhere, I think, aren't you? We, we hope. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Athletic trip, yeah. <laughs> so our birthday uh, this week comes from uh, the founder, co-founder of Costco named Jeffrey Brotman. Jeffrey Hart Brotman, born September 27th, 1942. He died at 74 suddenly. Um, it, he was at a big meeting with a bunch of Costco managers, had dinner, and died in his sleep. Um, and uh, it was a shock to everybody. It was uh, 2017. He's 74 years old. But he was originally going to be an attorney. And uh, he had gone to, uh, he grew up in Tacoma, Washington. His father owned a company called Seattle Knitting Mills. And uh, his uncles also had a chain of 18 retail stores called. Bernie's in Washington and Oregon. And uh, so he went to the University of Oregon, wanted to be an attorney, but the retail bug hit him because uh, he, uh, after school and after he got his law degree in 1967, he and his brother founded a women's jeans store named Bottoms. Kind of an unfortunate name. I don't know. Bottoms. <laughs> I'm, I in the only 80s. reacted late because I had to process that for a minute. You said he owned a. I had to process the whole lead into that, and I'm like, yeah. wait a minute. <laughs> Where'd you get your pants? There are bottoms. <laughs> bottoms. <laughs> the bottoms. And uh, in the 80s, and he founded that with Jeffrey Mike, uh, Jeffrey Mike, or he also founded a men's clothing store called Jeffrey Michael. But uh, his father suggested that he replicate the Price Club, which uh, was a, a San Diego-based chain of warehouses. And uh, so Brotman teamed up with James Senegal, who was a protege of Saul Price from Price Club, and uh, they decided to create Costco. So they, he, they didn't, really didn't have the money to do it initially, but he was on a plane that was struck by lightning and had to make an emergency landing. And during that time, he met a guy named Fred Paul Sell, who uh, actually was a capitalist who lent them and gave them the money to, to open Costco. Talk about a you know st- stroke of luck, I guess. Mm-hmm. And you know whether lightning strikes twice. The, um, so the first Costco store opened in Seattle, 1983. The same year that Sam's, uh, Sam Walton, the Walmart's Sam's Club opened. And uh, they were all, they merged with the Price Club a decade later. They became a retail uh, juggernaut, they said, by offering consumer goods at rock bottom prices. And of course, they're still famous for the rotisserie chickens, which still sell for four ninety nine. shockingly. And, and I, uh, am I, Tim, sidebar, am I correct that they were, they were going to change that because I think they lose money on those chickens. They lose money on the chickens and they lose money on the, the hot, hot dogs. dogs. The hot yeah. dog and a drink for a buck fifty, and the rotisserie <laughs> chicken. And uh, I don't, I'm not a fan of the chicken. Um, Neither am I. Because I don't think it's cooked enough and I think they're too big. They're almost fatty or something, like they're pumped. I don't know, that's just my opinion. If I get them, I make sure that I cook them a little longer. Yeah. That's just me. But I, I'm not a, I'm not a huge fan of the chicken for some reason. I didn't, anyway, Spike likes it though, my dog. So um, Spike's like Mikey; he'll eat anything. <laughs> they made a hundred and twenty billion dollars last year, Mister Nash. Jeez. Can you imagine? Second only to Walmart in terms of revenue. They um, he he said it. Uh, one of the philosophies that Brahman said he said it wasn't about buying cheap; it was about buying good value. So he said we weren't necessarily always the cheapest. But um, we did want to offer a good value. They also took very good care of their employees, which they were known for. Uh, very decent wage as well as great, uh, great health benefits. And um, as I said, they built Costco into be one of the greatest retailers in the world. Uh, $120 billion, 738 stores. And uh, also, they were early investors in Starbucks. So you know, they made some money there. Hmm. The um, one thing, though, he did use his money... Uh, for lots of philanthropy. He was on 13 different uh, boards and nonprofits. His wife, Susan, was a former Nordstrom executive. They uh, donated a uh, huge scholarship, student scholarship scholarship fund, which helped hundreds of students at the University of Washington to, uh, to go to school. As I said, he died in his sleep in Washington at the age of 74. And they think it was due to heart failure. So... so- he weirdly had what you and I call the millionaire's death, where you yes. go to 
bed one night and you don't wake up and you're not. But if it was a heart thing, it could have been. Hopefully, he he it was peaceful. I you know, but seventy four is young to me. Yeah, oh. it was young. <laughs> of course, it is right. Yeah, <laughs> and closer and, to it. And uh, but he yeah he had celebrated with a bunch of store owners. They said he was a very nice man. He was a low profile one. He he was an expert. They said at finding locations for the stores, not only uh, in the U S. but also internationally. And uh, he was kind of behind the scenes versus his partner Senegal, who was more the the public face. But he, uh, they said he was very well liked. Everybody, everybody adored him. He also later in life, um, he and his wife were involved in a lot of democratic uh, politics, in terms of donating and supporting um, Obama and so forth. So, uh, but yeah, so Costco, one of our favorite favorite stores, Costco wholesale. Our, you and I both had an odd experience our last trip. We didn't Recently. find what we. No, Our, you went on a Saturday. I went on a day that they shopped out all the prepared food, and I didn't get my stuffed peppers. And I groused a bit, but I'll go back. <laughs> I, listen, I'm with you. I was so angry. I actually have had listeners that have contacted me that heard that show when I said I made the mistake of going on a Saturday, and they and told like, you, "Oh my God, what were you thinking?" You know, people are, like, "Are you crazy?" But that's what you used to do when you worked the typical nine to five, right? You would have to go. Yep. Of course, you've had you your had own business for so long. You, yeah. you had flexible time a little more than yeah. than most, but yeah, it's not crazy. So happy birthday to Mr. Bratman. Are you going to Costco soon? I don't need to go for a couple more weeks. No. Okay. My, I'm the same. I got to I, I get enough for like actually two or three months worth of stuff, and then certain things start to you know go, and you're like, ah, right. I got to go get the bacon or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. No, certainly. So um, our shop talk today comes from uh, the country of Finland. And for the sixth year in a row, Finland was recognized as the happiest country in the world, if you can believe it or not. Um, I've been to Finland, though, and I did like Finland a lot. It was a, it was a sleeper for me. I would have never expected to go. I got sent there for work, a work event, and I loved it. I was there for uh, 12 days. I thought it was wonderful. But they're known as the happiest people on earth. Um, there's uh so the the department of tourism i guess the country's tourism department last march decided that they were called visit finland they were they announced that they were going to offer 10 people the opportunity to come to finland and learn um in a master class on happiness and they had over 150,000 people apply so <laughs> since there was such um an overwhelming uh response to this they decided to put um a master class online virtually so you can go watch it which i'm going to do i haven't done it yet but i want to see what it's all about and uh so it's going to take you from um the the five steps uh, that they believe or the steps that they believe will put you on the course to happiness which include nature and lifestyle health and balance design and food and well-being i thought of you immediately john because when i went through these <laughs> well i read it and i thought i i don't know how i stumbled into this right well it seems like i know we've talked about happiness a bit and um, but and we'll go through the list of what this one uh, reporter learned um, while she went through uh, from CNBC, I believe it was, while she went through this uh, this master class on happiness. So, what was the first thing that uh, she came upon? First, first big. So they broke this into three big things, as Tim mentioned. I mean, there might be f- more lessons embedded in this, but the big over the overarching ones. The first one is connecting with nature is important for your mental health, no matter where you live. Um, and she kicks off by saying, as someone who lives in a city, I thought reaping nature's benefits would be virtually impossible for me without traveling far. However, the course taught me that having a relationship with nature doesn't have to look like being in the forest or sailing on a river. It's more about being in tune with our five senses as we walk outside to do the simple things like grabbing a coffee or commuting to work. Um, this, so the, 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 the thought process here is be aware of your surroundings, try to get outdoors, be around you know, nature, and it doesn't need, mean like a, an isolated forest. It could be a park. It could be, you know, walking, taking a river walk or something. This reminds me of something a friend talks about all the time where he tries to do something every day called the moment of awe, mm-hmm. A-W-E, where he literally makes sure he pauses to see something in a different light or maybe the sun's landing on something a different way or he's watching two dogs play in a dog run or something but it's the moment of awe and that's his connecting his way of connecting with nature and saying and keeping him grounded i think that maybe i'm screwing it up a bit but i think that's the same thing yeah it's not like kind of stop to smell the roses 
exactly sort of thing, exactly know, that, yeah and and it could be it could be you on a bike ride it could be you walking to uh go get something at the store and you as they say here come upon something and then it uh you're communing with nature i guess or your mm -hmm. surroundings which i think is cool the second one has got you written all over it it's better to have enough than to want more this was number two <laughs> So it says, it says uh, when, we, when we're focused on more, we're actually never able to find enough. And the goalposts keep changing. Uh, is it Rainy? Is that how we say it? Rhine? R-I-N-N-E? -N -N -E. I was trying to, trying to figure out. Rhine. I would that. go with Rhine. Rhine. Yeah. And um, so she talks about um, defining enough as balance, harmony, and sufficiency. Embracing enough means having all that you need to thrive, but not carrying around excess. So it's really, I, I thought this was interesting because this is in direct conflict with the U.S. mantra of keeping up with the Joneses, right? Of, <laughs> you mean our capitalist consumer Right, society? I need this, yeah. I want that, I need this. Yeah. And I think in some ways a country like Finland, which is somewhat, um, what's the word, Hi, hype, um, what was the word, homogeneous, I guess? Mm -hmm. Homogeneous. And, uh, homogeneous. And a smaller population, it's easy, I think, to kind of do this because they have an outstanding school system as well. But mm -hmm. and people have studied it, but it's so um, encapsulated that it's it's easy to, to control some of these things, and so I thought this idea was interesting because uh, it was a direct conflict with I think our culture, don't you think? Oh yeah, I called this this section of her article uh, famous architect Mies van der Rohe. Less is more. He would use that in relationship to buildings, stripping down all the artifice and getting to the core of what a building is. But in this case, less is more. How much do you truly need? Right. And um, and this also, and what is that other phrase? Your possessions will possess you. Right. You know how much time it takes to maintain things in your life, like the garage is filled with this or whatever. So, I um. I'm guilty of being someone who loved to acquire when I was younger. I think that's what we did in our 20s, right? We bought books and tapes. Did you and acquire a lot? Oh, yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, ridiculous purchases. You what know, made we, you change? Because you're, you're not that way anymore, boy. No, no. I don't, I don't exactly remember the shift when it occurred, but it happened sometime in my late 30s or early 40s. And suddenly, if you move once or twice and you have to pack everything— then you start saying to yourself, why do I have all this? And you and Tim, you know, it was like, how many times did you move and you still had boxes that were from your years Never in opened. high school and college, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. It's just like you're carrying this whole freight train of baggage. So now I'm really like, I'm crazy about being minimalist and to the point of being OCD, where if I get some new shirts, a bunch have to go and if I can't make a decision. I'm like caught in a man. <laughs> it's crazy. But yeah, less, this is about less is more and less actually leads to more happiness because there's the objects that you do surround yourself with truly give you pleasure and meaning and they have a purpose and they're efficient. Well, they, yes. And they don't, uh, they don't weigh you down. You know, the one thing that, um, I forgot I had highlighted it here, but in the, in the passage before about the kind of communing with nature, mm -hmm. I want, I wondered if you pick this up, they had, there's a law called every man's rights in Finland. I saw which, that, yeah. Which grants people the right... I thought this was... Uh, this would never happen in the U.S. It grants people the right to roam and stay overnight in nature, regardless of land ownership. So mm. can you imagine if you lived in a nice piece of property and someone just comes and... It's allowed. It's it's every man's right. right. And you better hope it's not one of the states that have the stand-your-ground laws, right? right? But boom! I, <laughs> I, I thought, wow, that talk about it. <laughs> a different thing. So sorry for that sidebar, but that, no, that that's a up. good sidebar because here that would not happen here in many places. No. Like who's on my property? Uh, yeah. The, the, what was the last three? one, um, number three, is the way you design your space can impact your mental health. Um, in Finnish, we have an old saying that a poor man cannot afford bad quality. And what that means is you may be surprised to hear that good quality for her doesn't mean the most expensive things. Some things... Sometimes things can have more value to us because we made them with our own hands or the materials used to make them more sustainable and better for our planet. This whole, there's probably a bunch of lessons in here um, that you could extract or that she probably could take and do separate things with, but it's about designing your space. It's about being mindful of the objects around you and their, and their purpose. Uh, decluttering is definitely something. And, and setting up your space that it feels easy and natural for you to move into work from sit in front of a window get stuff done i do this with my office i sometimes 
have these like kind of crazy, you know how dogs have zoomies. I I, I kind of right. have purge zoomies, <laughs> where I just look at me, I look at a shelf and I'd be like, that shelf is filled, and I'll go crazy and throw some stuff or donate it actually. But it's about making a nice space for yourself. How I I this one to me, I I was trying to think about this and I was wondering whether I have. I don't know if I do. You have a favorite space in your house? Yeah. Like, is there a favorite uh, space? In, in our upstate house where I'm at right now, um, a room that I'm rarely in is still one of my favorite rooms. It's our guest our guest room. It's the back of the house. Right. And from those the two windows of that room, all you just see are trees and sky. And uh, there are, there'll be days if it's sunny and it's the winter where I'll go lay on the bed because the sun's coming in. And I'll read or something. But it's just such a peaceful room. And for some reason, it's just a room we... It's just... Use not use that often, but maybe that's what makes it special. It's just uh, something we're not in all the time. Now, do guests stay there, or would you make that an mm-hmm. office for yourself? Yeah. Now we have the guest house in the back, which I've actually never slept in. Um, Bob and I talk about that all the time. I'm like, I should sleep in the guest house, but that's a nice little building. But this, yeah, we've had guests in the room upstairs, and they like so, it too. So you wouldn't make that a you wouldn't make that an office for yourself then, if you enjoy that, that was room? that's being discussed because the yeah. more I'm in there, I'm like, boy, I really like this space. This is different than what I've been in the in before. You know, you make the mention of not having slept in the slept in the the guest suite. Yeah. And there was a woman down the street here that I I had met and they were looking at the house and then I've never heard this before. So they told the realtor that they would like the keys to the house and they'd like to spend a weekend in it. Interesting. To see if, to see if they liked it. And I and I just looked at her and I thought, "Well, that never happened." Sure enough, they did. And um I said, "Well, what did you do?" She said, "Well, we we slept in each of the rooms." You know, it was Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And we wanted to see where the light was during the day. And I thought, wow. And um, have you ever heard of that sort of thing? Yeah, they ended up buying the house. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a, you know, it was an expensive home. But I thought, oh, they're never going to allow somebody to come squatting in (laughs) for the... But can you imagine telling somebody, we'd like to spend the weekend in the house before we make a decision? And I said, and and slept in the various rooms to, to decide what bedroom they wanted to have and if they bought the house and where light was going to come in during the day. And I'd never heard of such a thing. I didn't know if that was common or not, or if you'd heard anything like that. The way you just said it. Yeah. I can't imagine someone coming in and squatting in the house. Cause that would be the big fear. They're yeah. in there and like, why should can't I get leave? out? I'm here now. <laughs> <laughs> we need to show the house. No, no, <laughs> oh, you showed it it's already. Supposed to it's snow. Nice. I want to see how the snow lays on the ground. When it... <laughs> so, yeah. Um, I like that. And that's a smart idea, right? Although I, don't you kind of get a sense from a home when you like, I know when we bought our house up here, like we knew inst- instantly that after 25 houses you look at, you walk into one, you're like, this is the one. Did you look at a bunch of houses? About 25. Yeah. Right. And then you knew right away that you, you just walk into some and go, no, Sandra, no. Yeah, and this passed what our friend Sonda calls the pitter patter test. So I walked in and I was like, I felt like it was in my grandmother's house and it just gave me great warm feelings because it was, you know, it's a, it's an older house. That's a great house. Yeah. I think your, I think your house is very cozy, very warm. It's a, cozy. it's 1928. Yeah. One of those yeah. kit houses, either uh, Montgomery Ward or Sears, but yeah. It's but it's so scaled. smartly designed. It's smartly designed. Yeah. It, it, uh, so. so there you go, folks. That was uh, an article that Tim found, which I really liked, and it's a, a Finnish masterclass um, in happiness. And I believe you can take these online, right? You could take the the class. Yeah, online. I'm gonna I'm gonna try to do it and see what the uh, see what you are okay. See what it's like and, and report back. I'll post this to our <laughs> Facebook page, so people can uh, can take a look at it and see if you're happier. Yeah. <laughs> All right. We want to thank you for joining us here on the Focus Group today. Focusgroupradio.com is the URL for our show. Everything's there in this broadcast and also our Tuesday podcast, TFG Unbuttoned. Big thanks to Deep Discount. And for the month of September, a thank you to the Criterion Collection. We've been giving discs away all month long. We're playing a game called Pick That Flick. You guess an audio clue, you could win a disc. If you missed it, thanks to Time Shifting, you could just rewind to our Deep Discount segment and hear this week's clue. We want to remind people, if you're going to be anywhere on the road, to don't text and drive, arrive alive. Everybody have a great week, and we'll see you in the new one. It's The Focus Group with Tim Bennett and John Nash. Accessible on all platforms. Subscribe, like, and rate us on your platform of choice. Learn more at focusgroupradio.com. That was a stunning focus group.